Hi, everybody. Hi. Thanks. Hello. Thanks so much for coming. This is so uh, what a what a great honor. Uh, I'm I'm thrilled to be here. Um, oh, I need this thing, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> Um, uh, so I teach at uh, SUNY New Paltz, which is about 75 miles north of here. A few of my former students are here, so thank you. I'll buy you a drink later. Um, uh, when Paul uh, on the board uh, emailed me and asked me if I wanted to uh, speak at the salon today, um, I, I was really, truly humbled. And, and I promise this is the only animated GIF I have, but um, I really felt like this. <laughs> Um, because for me, the, the TDC uh, holds a really special place in my uh, growth as a designer. I um, have been a member mostly on since 2005, although I'm realizing I think I owe my dues for this year. <laughs> Crop marks. Hold on a second. I'm going to see if I can get this to work. I could keep talking here. Yeah. Um, uh, so I first joined the TDC in 2005 as a graduate student, having mostly paid my dues every year since then, and, and here are my annuals to prove it. And I've met really some amazing people through the TDC, uh, I've listened to many outstanding talks and a few workshops, so um, you should uh, consider joining as well. Um, okay, so now on to uh, this talk, and I'm, I really give you all credit uh, for coming to a presentation with a title so pretentious as Speculative Typography as Critical Design Practice. Congratulations. Uh, that shows both dedication and a high level of self-loathing. Self uh, so I, I really appreciate you bearing with me, but I just wanted to share with you some other titles for the talk that I thought about first. So um, here we go. Let's see here. So uh, one, I think it was more than words, expressive type and extreme landscapes. But if you're over the age of 30, you might, might remember these guys. Um, so that made, maybe didn't quite work that well. Um, uh, reckless Intermediate Adventures in Typographic Exploration. So for me, Reckless Intermediate is, a, is kind of a way of life. Um, I describe it as my level of technical skill in most things, as well as my skiing ability. I'm kind of like this guy with a cape skiing down the hill, sort of not, not quite knowing what I'm doing, but doing enough to kind of get down the hill. So it's really my, my way of uh, working, and, and I think sometimes uh, it's okay not to be an expert in something to still make things happen. Um, uh, and then Master of Nothing, stand-up comedy for intellectual type geeks. Uh, I, I really kind of do consider myself a master of nothing. I'm, I'm sort of interested in everything, and I do uh, have a, a kind of excitement about everything. So that, that kind of, you know, I spread my wings into a lot of things instead of just being interested in one thing. Um, and, and in a way, comedy and uh, critical design have a lot in common. Um, and, you know, if I could bring together, like, Joan Rivers and then those two old guys from the Muppets, I feel like that's maybe my role in, in type. Um, both deal with cultural conflict through the amusement of an audience. And both use parody to subvert the meaning of an environment, object, or cultural practice. So what is critical design? If you've not heard of this term before, um, it's, it's really attributed to the, the interdisciplinary design studio Dunn and Raby, um, who's Anthony Dunn and Fiona Raby, who up, up until recently were also professors at the Royal College of Art in London uh, in the Design Interactions Program. And they're now here in New York at the New School as professors of design and emerging technology program. I, I hope they're not here tonight, because then I might like be really nervous. Um, but their, their 2013 book called Speculative Everything, Design Fiction and Social Dreaming, Dunn and Raby encourage us to consider design as a discipline for generating ideas rather than only as a discipline for, quote, finding solutions uh, for designing functional and consumable artifacts. Dunn and Raby employed the term critical design out of a concern with, uh, towards an uncritical approach towards technological progress, right? We kind of see technology and think, ooh, it must be better because of that technology. Uh, and this is a quote from them, critical design uses speculative design proposals to challenge narrow assumptions, preconceptions, and givens about the role products play in everyday life. And certainly, um, objects that work and engage and, and, and you know, inform and delight, as, we, as we've all heard, are important and necessary but the intention is to get us to ask more what if questions, right? Questions that speculate rather than relegate design to the broad goal of making it work. So maybe we can do something else. 
Um, in speculative design, we can imagine not only future solutions, but also future problems. Freeing ourselves from the constraints of the current state of things means that we can use design principles and strategies to formulate possibilities for future realities, rather than only providing answers. And so while much of the work of Dunn and Raby and other critical design practitioners focus on you know, industrial design and architectural design, uh, we also reach into areas of social practice and visual communication. Um, you might have heard of Metahaven. Uh, Metahaven is a Dutch design and research studio known for its merging of identity design, political action, and a giant middle finger to the general rules of good typography, um, and certainly well known for its speculative and critical design practice. Um, in a 2013 interview, Metahaven provokes the, the concept of design as basically a high-res censorship. Uh, the idea that design is always framing and therefore editing a message. The choices we make as designers have ramifications, and Metahaven uses criticality as a lens for making. And uh, they, they uh, in 2011, they art directed and um, wrote uh, basically this, this um, um, issue of print magazine. I don't know if ever, anybody remembered seeing this, but a lot of people were really angry. There was like, you know, riots in the streets about this because it, it, it's, it does not conform to kind of what we expect a design practice to look like. So they're very much asking these what if and, and really kind of challenging questions. Um, Although when we think of a critical design practice, we might assume this kind of post-apocalyptic version of typography where letter forms are horribly distressed and color palettes make our eyeballs bleed. But maybe we can expand our definition of critical design into the realm of typography and type design that could, you know, can also expand the practice. So what if or can we apply critical design theory and practice to using and making type? Um, and, and maybe perhaps because uh, type is so technical, right? There's a there's a real learning curve there. Um, uh, you know, the 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 the, the, the skill needed. Uh, we we really focus on a lot of these details, and and of course these things are absolutely really important. Um, uh, so I'm kind of sort of asking this question to you as well, and and going to be showing you some of my work. Um, I don't know, is, is fuck yeah typeface design Tumblr uh, a form of, of critical practice? I'm not sure. I, I question that. Uh, maybe, maybe it is. Um, certainly uses humor. It's certainly kind of commentary on uh, the, the type business and industry um, uh, in, this, in this kind of language that we all understand of memes. But, but maybe we can move beyond this as well. Um, I won't have time. Oops, I won't have time to mention everything, but I want to just show a few examples of some kind of critical design practice in typography and, and type design. So, uh, many of you might be familiar with Vim Kroll's 1967 New Alphabet. Uh, this was a speculation on adapting work to new technologies, such as the the CRT monitor. Uh, designed using only horizontal lines, the typeface stretches legibility to an extreme, but at the time really challenged what were the future possibilities of, of digital type. So really very much speculating on what could happen with digital type in, in the future. And of course he designed this not with the intention that it would you know, absolutely be used, although it was used in several examples uh, many years later, um, but again just kind of foreseeing what are some of the possibilities and, and questions that, that come up. Certainly the work of um, letter error and, and their continued commitment to the experimental and speculative possibilities through programming and type design. This is um, Beowulf from 1991. Uh, and this was a, a, the, really the first of its kind to randomize every time it was typed, uh, the, the, the type would change subtly. So it really started to bring in these questions of type intelligence and, and intelligence embedded into the font itself. Uh, with Matthew Carter's 1995 Walker typeface, the designer can choose among five different types of serifs to attach to any character. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this was designed for a, a branding purpose for the Walker Art Museum, but this is a, an, a, a fax that was actually sent uh, from Carter to the design director 
of the Walker Art Museum at the time, Lori Haycock Michaela. Uh, and in it, he talks about this variability of snap-on serifs as, quote, the typographic equivalent of vocal inflection. So he was presenting this as very much a what-if possibility, and the, the Walker used it for many, many years and is a very successful part of their identity, and it really became a, a part of their identi identity in a very meaningful way. Uh, maybe a less known example is this Picklig font, and this is from 2005 from a German designer named Christina Schultz. Um, this is a very early use of open type technology and kind of around the same time that I was, I was doing some of my work as well. So we had some communication when we were, when we were doing our early open type projects. Um, but again, I, I think looking back on this now, you know, 12, 10 years later, uh, this is really precursoring what, what's possible uh, bringing kind of image and type together in our, in our uh, written community and our, you know, typed communication. So this idea that you could take, you know, a, a combination of characters that would make uh, um, a, a nice little ligature there is, at the time, was quite a new possibility. But it is, you can license it through um, Font Shop. And uh, this is a project by um, Peter Cho, where the, the user actually speaks um, into a, a microphone that uh, shows you some of your voice directly on a screen. So the, the, the sound responding um, to the, the intonations in the voice. And it has some ideas and thoughts around what are some of these barriers between verbal and visual communication. I could go on and on and on about all these amazing projects, but I just wanted to show you a few of, of how we can actually situate um, a lot of type uh, into this kind of speculative future fictional possibilities of critical design. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of my own work over the past um, 10 years, some of its finish, some of its random thoughts, some of its Twitter discussions and, and in progress things. So we hear about this idea of the side project a lot. We're always told like, do your fat, do your passion project, right? Do your side project. And I like to say, I don't have side projects. I have a research agenda. Um, Maybe you can try that too. See what your boss says about that one. I, and I, I recognize that this is a very privileged and unique position to be in, in part because um, I am a full-time faculty member. So doing research and creating new knowledge for the field is part of what I'm supposed to hopefully be doing. But this is not even necessarily clearly defined in design education. Many design educators creative practice is about making good client work and getting presented in exhibitions, et cetera. And, and that is perfectly fine. I think that is um, a really important practice. But I teach at a liberal arts college um, where engaging students in critical thinking is as important as engaging them in the visual principles of design and form. And our students do get jobs too, so it's OK, right? <laughs> um, my undergraduate degree is in cultural studies from McGill University, and that really informs uh, how I work and how I think. So this, I, this what if question is constantly in my head um, in everything that I do. So uh, Type Talk Fonts was my uh, MFA thesis project. Um, I began grad school really thinking about visual representations of identity. Uh, I grew up in a, a house with people that spoke five different languages. So I've always been very interested in language and, and what it means um, and, and how it portrays identity or suggests identity. Um, and from this, I, I became very interested also in handwriting and what handwriting says about us uh, personally. Um, so I started making these handwriting fonts that were pretty ugly and didn't really do much except, uh, you know, looked like your handwriting. And again, at the time, in 2005, handwriting fonts were around. They weren't as ubiquitous as today. Um, but I begged my advisor to let me take a course, a, a class in sociolinguistics. And this was a really a game changer for me to really think about how the way that we speak um, very much has a connection to our identity or our, our variety of identities. So I started thinking about um, how can uh, we give the feeling of a handwriting font with a uh, feeling of handwriting within the confines of a font um, and that the handwriting somehow expresses something about ourselves. So I don't have to just stop this for one tiny second and pull this up. Whoops, not that, this one. There we go. So uh, this is one of the handwriting fonts. It's based on the, the, the um, handwriting of a nine-year-old girl. So she's very nice. She won't let you curse. So if you try to say that someone is an asshole, she's going to change that for you. 
um, because you're writing it in her handwriting. So you can see here that uh, she's writing it. Um, and you know, it, it really kind of takes a new level of what is possible with OpenType. So instead of saying fuck you, she'll, it'll change automatically to go away. So again, the, the language is really being controlled and edited by the typeface itself rather than the author. Um, I, by the way, my brother is here, and I just want to say I love my brother very much. I didn't know he was going to come today. He's awesome. He's awesome. Um, so that was one of them called Sugar and Spice, right? And so it doesn't let you curse using OpenType. Um, this next one is called Shy Slacker. Uh, it's based on the handwriting of a teenage boy. So uh, it kind of uses the intonation of, of how we talk and use the word like and kind of um, gives you the personality, his personality. So at, every time you type a comma, it adds the word like. And when you type wanna, want to, it changes it to wanna. So it very much gives more the sense of um, uh, of how he would actually speak, right? And so you can see here that I've got the ligatures turned on, and I'm I'm doing this in. Um, in text edit, right? So this works. And what you can see here, when I've turned on the, te the contextual alternates, I've added uh, something that makes it look like he is stuttering. So again, adding these layers of, of personality or of who we are, of how we identify ourselves, uh, this can happen through the font. Uh, the good news for you is that I've made these available on GitHub. So you can download these fonts and go play with them yourself. But you have to promise me that you're not going to use them in like real projects because, <laughs> frankly, they're pretty ugly, right? Like the world does not need more ugly handwriting fonts, but maybe it will inspire you to think more about how your choices in type really do connect and, and make a difference with your content. This is a, an angry kid that won't let you type anything, right? <laughs> no one, we know some of those. Um, so Persona Type is another project that I worked on a couple of years ago. Um, I, I'm very much interested in exploring, as you can see, this kind of personality of type, and uh, and also what is possible. What what do we mean? What what can specimens really do? If you really think about what a specimen does. Um, so I spent a couple of year, a couple of well, maybe a couple months um, trolling my friends on Facebook and Twitter, and and just really looking at how we communicate. Um, in, in, you know, in, in this very personal communication, right? Um, we're having conversations with people that would have been spoken 20 or 30 years ago, but we're doing a lot of amazing things in very, um, uh, in real constraints to still make our voice heard. And we're doing that uh, with, with how we write. So I started to break down what are some of the possible, what are, you know, what are the ways that we're doing this? So we're doing this through visual pronunciation, through phonetic laughing, through expressive punctuation, right? Uh, through random capitalization. Right? And so, you know, Facebook, unlike um, other, you know, uh, what, what came before it? My, uh, what was the one? MySpace, right, where you could, you could just um, uh, personalize it to no end, right? Facebook doesn't allow you to do that, yet I, I find it so fascinating how we still find ways to, to make it our own. Um, and so you can see you're removing or adding spaces. All of this adds expressiveness to the way that we communicate. I, I hope you're all not thinking like, oh god, is that my stuff? I can't believe she screenshotted my conversation. This is not, again, this is not really necessarily anything new if we look back um, into the history of graphic design uh, and certainly into the history of concrete poetry and of um, uh, some of the, the, the work of modernist typographers who are really seeking ways of, of kind of playing with expressiveness in this vocal tone. Um, both of these examples are you know, almost 50 years apart Right, but um, but both of them uh, very much are, are part of the the kind of history of expressive type, and we're doing this now digitally as well. This is a project from a few years ago um, of a performance artist and um, computer science uh, a professor from Carnegie Mellon who worked together to create this um, this really interesting. Um, live performance. And in this case, let's see, the, the, the way that he's talking 
the, the, type that, the, the type that you're seeing is actually responding directly to his intonation and the way that he's talking. I don't think we can hear the volume right now, but that's okay. You get the idea though, right? Makes sense, yeah. So um, we can certainly go to that and check it out more. Let's see here. There we go. Uh, Ursa, Ursinate, right, was a, um, a, uh, a, a great uh, poem uh, concrete poem. Here we go. So yeah, I get emotional over fonts too. I don't know about you guys, but I feel pretty uh, right. Don't you right? Like that's why we're here, right? We're all here just to get emotional over fonts. Um, okay, here we go. Um, so persona type. Uh, this is a kind of experiment in what type specimens are supposed to or can do, but also in the sense of what they do on the web. So on the web, um, we, we can now embed animation into our HTML pages. They don't necessarily have to be separate videos. Um, and this has a lot of implications of what's possible um, with type on the web. So um, I created this site, and it uses CSS transition for the animation. Um, I wonder if the sound is going to play. I guess we'll find out. Um, so uh, what I was really thinking about at the time was, you know, what, what, are, what are some of these personas that we give or we assign to type, bad or good, um, happy or sad, you know, this questionable masculine versus feminine. These are the ways that we talk about type, and, and these are the ways that um, people think about type. Um, so what, what, what does this look like? If a typeface could talk, what would it say? If a typeface, typeface could move, how would it move? Um, so I, I worked with uh, anybody that would help me out to create these what I call living type specimens. So let's see what happens here. I hope this sound is going to work. I'm not hearing it, so I don't think that the sound is going to work. Oh well. Bummer. Looks like the sound is on. Um, well, we can look at that. Uh, so, uh, right, the idea with this is that, and, and all, you can see that all of the um, the text that I'm that I'm using here are from are, are gathered from um, social media, YouTube comments, Facebook comments. Uh, Craigslist misconnections. I find that this language is just really fascinating and and so interesting of how um, we're co sort of constantly communicating online, um, and we're communicating in. Uh, this was a Craigslist ad about a guinea pig. <laughs> maybe our maybe our specimen text can um, can say something. You know, a specimen is right. It's supposed to be this like model of how your typeface is supposed to work, right? It's it's the most you know beautiful way that you're really showing off what what's possible with the typeface. Uh, so if we have typefaces that can talk and move, uh, how how would specimens change from that? So um, I want to talk about this idea of provocations for speculative, speculative typography. And this idea comes out of a, a book um, called The Library Beyond the Book by Jeffrey Schnapp and Matt Battles. Um, and in it, it talks about the future possibilities of the library as both a digital and physical space for archiving, distributing, and generating new knowledge. Um, and you can see that uh, there are these small design prompts featured on each spread. And these provocations ask readers to consider speculative design strategies for imagining the library in new ways. And this is the way that I, my brain works when I think about typography. So I'm going to share with you now some sort of speculative provocations that I've imagined and that I have for you as well. This is a great book, by the way. You should get so what if Google is a concrete poet? What if every surface is a site for typographic design? Um, you might be familiar with this Google um, Translate app that came out. I think it was last year. Uh, and it's actually a very useful thing. If you're traveling in a country in a language that you're not familiar with, you can use this phone, this uh, app on your phone and hold it up to a sign, and it will translate it into a language that you know. And that can be from English to Chinese, Chinese to English. I mean, there's you know, many, many fonts, or many, many languages, sorry, that, um, 
uh, that, it, that it can work with. So it's a really exciting uh, thing, and I think it's actually it's quite useful tool. But if you put this, of course, in the hands of type people, things change. Um, I, I looked a little bit more into how the app was built, and I thought it was very interesting that they use um, the, the app, the, the, the technology uses convolutional neural networks to help train the application to better recognize letter forms in the real world. So I like that they are using these dirty, what they're calling dirty letters, to train to help train the app to become more accurate. Um, so I think it was Ben Shaken, who is pretty active on Twitter that I follow, posted uh, some of his like little experiments with Google Translate. And you can see that not only does it, you know, it changes the, the actual type because it only shows everything in this like garbled Helvetica. Um, but you can start to see that it, if you use it out in the world where you're not supposed to, you get these really wacky, strange places where letters and words pop up everywhere, right? So this is, if I'm holding my phone up using this app with the, with the camera on to a, garb, to a gas station, it starts to translate, tries to translate everything it sees, even when there may or may not be letter forms there. It's pretty amazing. So of course I saw this and like my mind was like, you know, I did that whole thing. Um, this is from John Parker, another um, person I follow on, on Twitter, and this was some of his Instagram feed, and we all kind of got crazy with it and started using this hashtag Google typographer, you know, Google is this typographer, and uh, this is, John holding his camera up to, his phone up to a screen, right? And these words kind of appear in the app, right? Because again, all this app is trying to do is help translate your words for you. Um, so it's, it's actually quite beautiful and, and kind of lovely and amazing. John said he lost a lot of Instagram followers from this because people were just like, <laughs> stop doing that. Um, these were a few more of his that I just, I, I mean, these are just like absolutely amazing. I really want to curate like an exhibition of just these Google typographers. Like, they're just absolutely beautiful. Um, so I, I said something to Ben, like, uh, did somebody make a Tumblr of these yet or what? And Ben did. So I think it's um, Google typographer.tumblr. These are a few of mine. I started, I started getting really obsessed with like trying this on everything, right? Food packaging. I spent like weeks just in front of my TV, in front of CNN with like the news scroll, just holding my phone up to it, really driving everybody crazy. So you can see like the State of the Union instead of, you know, it just says buy out it. Just amazing stuff. And you can see here on my bookshelf, you know, it, it, it's, it, these are, this is like a glitch, right? This is not supposed to happen, but, but they're, they're just these little beautiful moments. Um, I thought this rule was really nothing like beautiful, like this breaking news becomes this leaking, leaking news. Um, and this, you know, just, what is this saying? Funk secret, I fit, it's like, it's just amazing, you know. Um, everything just all of a sudden has this kind of amazing, beautiful poetry to it. Uh, and I, I thought to myself, like, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning when I was trying to rock the baby to sleep, I was like, wow, what if I, like, made a font? And you could only you like it would only show up in Google Translate, you know, like it, it just looked like weird. But then you, I didn't do that actually. So, and I realized, like, but to Google Translate, everything is a typeface, right? Like every surface is a typeface. It's pretty sort of magical. So you start to get this like crazy, weird, po you know, concrete poetry that happens. So try it out. What's very interesting about it now? I was playing with this uh, on the bus down here too. So using these textures, because it, every time it's being used, uh, it, it's training itself to be more accurate. So these, these kind of inaccurate, glitchy moments are almost a little bit harder to do now, because as it's being used for functional purposes, these glitchy moments are kind of moving away. So, so they're actually, it's, it's all just quite interesting. I don't know what it means. These are, my, these are speculations, right? You guys can, we can decide that in the Q&A. Um, what if there were font-specific emoji? And, and I think that there are some font-specific emoji. I keep asking this and people just keep like laughing at me and they're like, ha, ha, ha. that's so silly. Why would you, why would you ever do that? But you know, I mean, why not, right? We have, I, I, I don't understand why our emoji have to be specific to operating systems if our typeface is not so, did I just blow your mind, Matt? I'm sorry. Okay. So, th there's no relationship between these two things. I don't want to say that, you know, like the Helvetica A is like the, the Google heart eyes or anything, but I'm just trying to just make the pointers that, that 
maybe, you know, what would happen, what would happen if we had font-specific emoji? I mean, certainly our kerning tables would get really messy in the, um, uh, but we're using emoji now in such interesting and uh, expressive ways. I don't, I, I'm, I'm really fascinated by this, which is something that I'm thinking about a lot. So, um, you know, what if? There's my provocation for you. I just love this like typology of, of emojis, like how they look slightly different in every operating system. It, it's, it's really quite lovely. The Google ones are just the best. Why are they so blobby? They're so cute. Um, how might we construct a history of specimens on the web? I, I spoke about this a few months ago at Face Forward, but um, you know, if we think about type specimens on the web, we think about our own personal uh, those of us that, that collect specimens and collect type ephemera, right? We have wonderful archives now where we can go and like touch this stuff and it's beautiful and we can look at all these like amazing books and things like that. What's going to happen to all of uh, the amazing things we're making on the web? What's going to what's going to happen to all this beautiful web ephemera in 50 years? The the Internet Archive is a pretty good. Um, a place for that, right? So you can go to archive.org. Does everybody know about the, right, the Wayback Machine? And you can look at what a website looked like 10 years ago, whatever. But um, it's not always that accurate. It's not always supported in every new browser. So, you know, this is looking at type specimens as PNGs from 1996 to these really beautiful and, and complex um, HTML specimens uh, by OK Type in 2003, um, and I, I wonder, you know, I just I wonder what what happens to these beautiful ob they, they are beautiful objects too, right? So um, I see writing as a huge part of my critical practice, um, and over the past few years, writing has really um, become very important to me. Um, I, I feel that it helps clarify my thoughts and has pushes, pushed me to consider what it is that I'm actually making. Um, in 2013, Typophile sent out a request on t Twitter looking for bloggers who would regularly post. post so I was like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. So I, I, and it was kind of a good challenge for myself because it sort of fo forced me to, 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 to really write and, and you know, put this stuff down, what I, what I was constantly thinking about. Um, so for, for that summer, I, I was pretty good about posting almost weekly. And these were really just kind of typographic discoveries and kind of just commentaries on the world around me, um, you know, from annoying my, my eye doctor. You know, I don't know if you guys ever have this situation, but like you go to the eye doctor and like, can you read line three? And you're like, well, I think that's a P, but like the, the shape and it's kind of, a, I know it's a P, but the bowl is a little bit, you know, and it, yeah, like, wow, it's really hard to get a reading on you. You're just annoying. Um, uh, to thinking about um, uh, that, that summer is when um, cloud typography was announced, the, the Heffler cloud typography, their web fonts were really anticipated, so I, I kind of like jokingly thought like, well, what? What happens when you Google cloud typography? Like maybe they're not going to have great Google stats. That their Google stats were fine. But I found all this other amazing, weird cloud typography, like from people collecting these pictures of clouds that look like alphabets to like weird ASCII art that has clouds in it. Um, I also did a little crowdsourcing questionnaire about what I should pay for practical typography. Um, it was a, a web-based book that Matthew Butterick came out with at the time. And so he basically gave you this option of, you know, you could, you could pay like $7 or buy my fonts. And so it was like between $7 and $90. That's a really big difference between like what, what should you, I don't know, what is it? So I just asked people to vote on what I should pay for it. And then I paid whatever that voting was. It was $7.50. So typophile readers are cheap. <laughs> Sorry, Matthew. And then um, the, the rent is too damn high. When we were in New York, so you guys know about the rent is too damn high. Um, it's a political party who has like a, just a single platform, basically, that just the rent is too damn high in New York City. So I use this as a way of kind of framing a discussion about conference fees uh, for, for type conferences being really high at the time. Um, the A Type I conference was like $1,000 or something in Amsterdam. And so people were getting really frustrated with, you know, who has access. So there was like a, this nice little funny parallel to things. Um, Right. So then that same summer, this, this showed up on Twitter, this, this great, wonderful Tumblr called Fonts and Boobs. Um, and, uh, you know, 
it was kind of this really shocking thing to see how people reacted to this from just totally like, this is so funny and cool, to people just really being outraged and, and just kind of seeing what, what that range of, um, of reactions were. I like practically spit my coffee out and was like, I can't believe this shit is happening in 2013. And, and you can see that the, the way that the language is, and like it's, it's very much uh, speaking to a very specific person. Um, and, and I think it's very, very limiting to think about uh, maybe who, who might not appreciate fonts and boobs. So, right, you can see here like, hey, you like fonts and girls? Cool. Um, and, and I like that, like, one point, like, here's how you can help me out. Hey, girls, you're welcome to submit if you think your breasts could support a great font. Like, I couldn't believe that this was, like, this is for real. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah? Okay. So I decided, like, I would make my own version of that called Fonts and Breastfeeding because I felt <laughs> that, um, you know, fonts like breasts are useful tools. They have a function first, and we fetishize both of them. But it, at the end of the day, they really have a functional aspect to them. So if you want to submit uh, you know, something, all of the, the pictures that I used are all Flickr, Commons approved. These are all like pro breastfeeding uh, websites and things like that. So um, you're, you're welcome to submit something if you want. But I felt like it just put a little bit of a positive spin on um, this, this fonts and boobs thing. Because clearly, the world needs more boobs in their type specimens, right? So let's challenge that a little bit. Um, yeah, these were a few more of the specimens that I made. So. Um, and this kind of leads into this idea of critical engagement as community building. By the way, I just want to take a moment here. I didn't talk about the type that I'm using in my lecture here, which, like, you know, that takes a long time to think about. But the, the, the really wacky one up there is Blenny by Spike, Spike Sondick. And the, the one below it is Beloved Sands by um, Laura Worthington. And then the other sans serif that I'm using is Freight Sands. So um, critical engagement as community building. Um, you know, I think that as type nerds, we have this real sense of just of, of being really snobbish and being really um, exclusive, right? That we are part of some sort of, you know, exclusive special club of like high awesomeness that no one else will ever get, right? Um, and, and I really want to challenge that, and I really want to welcome as many people into what it is that we do in, in a way that, that is encouraging and, and gets people excited about, about it. Um, so last summer, uh, um, there was a, you know, some, some Twitter discussions about female speakers and the lack thereof at, um, at type conferences. And you know, a really good discussion came out of how, how these things could be how the ways that we approach and encourage more people that are not just white dudes to um, speak at conferences and be active. Um, uh, uh, so um, this was a, a Storify that was put together by um, Indra Kupferschmidt that you can um, read up on if you want to read more about it. Um, but you know, at that same time, a few of us were kind of emailing around and kind of talking about these discussions and you know, what could we do? And um, uh, uh, Alphabets was born eventually. So Alphabets is a website that um, supports and promotes uh, the work and research of women in type-related fields. Uh, Indra and I kind of put this together very quickly, um, uh, nights and weekends and whenever else. Um, and we just kind of really, it was, it was rough and dirty. And again, that kind of reckless intermediate attitude about things, just get it done. Don't worry if it's perfect. Um, it, will, it will work itself out. And, and it did. Um, so, uh, you know, we encourage contributions from, from anybody. And we, we really try to do things that help promote, promote and support um, women. These are a few of our headers. So. Um, we, you know, you can certainly go to the about page and contribute, um, or find out how you can get involved, or if you have a, an article you want to submit. Um, and so, uh, I think what this does is it's just a, a kind of like a new, um, uh, another voice, right, for typography. And I think, you know, I've written for other people. There's something about being able to write um, and publish and, and talk about it in a way that that really breaks down the hierarchies. That's really exciting. Um, so um, that, that's, that's alphabets. Um, we did a series a couple of last month called Love Letters that um, one every, every day somebody posted a little tiny bit about something that they loved, some sort of typographic ephemera from you know, type specimens to collections of stamps um, to Elizabeth had a great collection of these like Italian magazines. 
those amazing ladies. Um, and, and I think uh, just encouraging people to write it's very hard, I think, especially for designers, somehow there's like this fear of writing that it's like somehow this big nasty beast and like, I don't write, I'm a designer, right? Um, but, but we have things to say and I think that if we encourage um, uh, our community to write more, I think it, it helps uh, with our practice as well. Um, so how can we bring a critical design practice to our work. Um, for me, everything uh, is questionable, everything is interesting, and everything is content. Um, at the end of their book, Dunn and Raby situate the proposal as the center to a critical design approach, right? This idea of the what if. Um, and this is a quote from their book, if our ideas don't change, then reality won't either. Um, so allowing uh, for work that is imaginative and probably and provocative encourages audiences and arguably ourselves as design practitioners to question the status quo. So um, thanks for coming. Thank you. Hey. When you were showing us the Google Translate stuff, did you ever figure out what it was that it was seeing that would correspond to a certain letter form? Or was, did you make any sense of it, or was it just it seemed completely? Or did you ask anyone at Google? I didn't ask anybody at Google. I mean, I think it, I think it, um, I think it was just trying to, you know, if it saw something, and again, this is we were doing this pretty early when they first dropped it, so I feel like the app itself wasn't quite trained yet to recognize, you know, letters. But um, from a from a practical standpoint, I mean, it's it has gotten quite accurate. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's fun. Go play with it. To do them though, you have to like. It's really tricky because you have to like hold it up and then as you're holding it up you can't, you have to like take a screenshot on your phone which is really like annoying because you're like trying to keep it straight and not, because if you just move it a little bit, the words will change and it might start saying something completely different. So it's like such these like beautiful fleeting moments. Yeah, you feel almost bad capturing them because they're so like beautiful. So um, with the, the, the talk, type talk fonts, that was my um, graduate work. So I, um, for the most part, the open type programming, I, I did myself. I bought like Leslie Carbera's Learn Font Lab fast. And I had to learn it fast. And I you know, just worked on it. And then at the time, I had also created a, a Flash-based demo of it because at the time open type was not supported on the web although it's not it's like almost we're almost there with uh, now but um, I uh, I worked with some people that just you know just very generous people that um, were just willing to just give me like little tiny snippets of code like just that like little hump and I and I think you know we we put so much pressure on ourselves to like do everything ourselves I for me I get to a point where I just know I can't do anything anymore and I have to ask somebody else and that's that's perfectly fine um, and and I think most people are really generous and, and willing to help if they can so um, and then in, with persona type I actually worked with an undergraduate student of mine uh, that summer and um, he worked on some of the the working out the animations in CSS uh, just because it was just a lot of work to do and um, but we worked on that together yeah um, but yeah, Reckless Intermediate, the guy going down the ski hill with the cape, that's pretty much me in the code. I mean, if you if you look at under the hood at any of these, like the code is kind of sad and like sometimes I'm using pixels instead of rems for the, sorry. Um, but you know, that's okay. Like, it, you know, it's, it's okay too. I think you have to just decide like to what end, like what's the purpose of what it is that you're trying to do, yeah. Somebody asked what are ends, uh-oh. Questions? 
Do you think the Intero Bank will ever come back? The Intero Bank is back. <laughs> <laughs> Alphabet's brought it back. It actually was actually one of the um, the love letters that was written. Did you see that there? Yeah. Um, that that article I think got one of the largest viewings from the whole month. Um, but but you know like the Intero Bank like it's interesting right? And I think the reason why the Intero Bank is not back yet is just because it's really hard to find. Right, like yeah. when you're typing quickly on a keyboard, or you know, I think I think we should do this now when we're typing. We're not doing this anymore. We're doing this. Like it's it's hard to get to it. So so that's part of why I think some forms of typographic language disappear because they're just simply harder to get to. So I think you know, an emoji is easier to access on your phone, right? So we're going to use it. No, it hurts. Don't know. It's embrace it. Love it. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, it's a good it's a good question. I think if I think if emo if the tarot bang was like right on the beginning of the keyboard, we'd see a lot more of it. Do you know what the intero bang is? Look it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the the question mark exclamation point together glyph. Amazing. It solves so many things. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, oh, wait. Oh. Oh. No, the Drake type. Does Drake owe me? Oh, it's on GitHub, so if he. No, it says like Drake, if you're reading this, it's too late. Like, it's the same thing. Did they use it? Maybe they used it. It's by a guy named Jim Joe. He's okay. He's like a graffiti street artist. Okay. This was, we should, we should talk, but this was a five year old boy who gave me his handwriting. So. No, but same with Drake. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Cool. Thanks, guys. Okay.